David Wilson is a leading historian of modern Irish history and the history of the Irish in North America. A professor of history at the University of Toronto, Dr. Wilson has written books on subjects ranging from Irish radicalism in the early United States to the history of Irish nationalism in Canada. In Canada, he is probably best known for his two-volume study of the pivotal Confederation politician Thomas Darcy McGee. Dr. Wilson is also the general editor of the multi-volume and ever-expanding Dictionary of Canadian Biography. He recently visited Memorial University to deliver the annual George Story Lecture. Despite a busy schedule, he managed to sit down with Memorial English professor Deneen Farquharson to discuss his latest research on the Fenian underground in Canada, a group of Irish nationalists that organized several raids in Canada between 1866 and 1871. Dr. Wilson also offered his thoughts on the current state of historical scholarship in the contemporary university. Welcome to the fourth episode of Cross Currents, a podcast of Memorial University's Nexus Center for Humanities and Social Science Research. My name is John Sandloss, and I am the director of the Nexus Center and the producer of the podcast. I want to start by thanking John Sandlos and the Nexus Center for inviting, or maybe better, allowing me to be a guest host of a Cross Currents podcast. Uh, and I also would like to sort of give a warning to our listeners that our, uh, my guest today, Dr. David Wilson, and I have known each other for a great number of years, and we've been friends for a very long time. And so if our conversation becomes what might sound to you listeners as um, passionate or even enraged, we're not really. <laughs> it's collegial and it's fun. So um, I welcome David Wilson from the University of Toronto. And um, David Wilson is the 2018 George Story Lecturer. And so we're taking the occasion of his visit to Memorial to have a chat about things as related but also widespread as writing history, Brexit, and um, the Irish Fenian underground in Canada. So welcome, David. Good to be here. Um, we spoke briefly yesterday about some things that we both wanted to discuss. And the first thing that came up, and we both thought was a good place to begin, was generally the topic of writing of history. And so I'm going to start with asking you a personal question, and then we'll move on from there. But how did you come to be a historian, an academic historian? Well, when I was um, in grammar school or high school in England, the last thing I wanted to do was to be an historian. Um, and I think, in fact I know, that's because of the way it was taught. Uh, imagine this, I come into uh, a new school at the age of 16. There are five people, five students in the class, and the teacher walks in smoking his pipe, uh, he has his gown and chalk dust is flying everywhere and he puts his yellowing pages on the table and he begins. In 1789 there was a revolution in France. Write it down. This was due to six causes, the first of which were the philosophes. There were four philosophes, Voltaire, Montesquieu, Diderot and Rousseau. Together they sacked the fabric of the Ancien Régime and paved the way for revolutionary change. There's a new boy. Well, uh, I had two years of that. And at the end of those two years, I never wanted to see a history book or have anything to do with history ever again. But you remember what the lecture was <laughs> and the causes of the revolution. Indelibly imprinted on my mind. <laughs> For I should, all the wrong I should, reasons, I should right? add also that we had no idea how to write essays, so all yeah. we did was uh, basically copy narrative out of books, and we would get lines through. We thought the longer our essays were, the better they would be, and, uh, and our teacher would just put lines through saying, irrelevant, 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 but he would never actually tell us how to write an essay, right. not until just before the exams, when suddenly the scales fell from my eyes, because... He introduced the concept of analytical writing, which was quite foreign and quite wonderful. Uh, but I went to university doing uh, social sciences, and um, and I stumbled into back into history by accident. Uh, this was the University of York in England, and there was a professor, um, Gwyn A. Williams, professor of Welsh history and Marxist history and uh, revolutionary history and medieval history, you name it. And he had a reputation for being a tremendous speaker. 
and attendance at lectures was entirely optional. They weren't connected to courses. And so that meant bad lecturers had maybe three or four people showing up. Gwyn A. Williams had packed lecture houses. And I, he gave a talk, uh, I remember this very well, um, it was on the myth of Madoc, the myth of Welsh-speaking uh, Native Americans, uh, and how this myth evolved and the different functions that it had. And I'd never heard anything like it. Um, he was a remarkable man. He was about five feet tall. He had a terrible stammer, but he used a great political effect in his speeches. He's the most brilliant orator I ever heard. And as he once said to me, because um, we got to know each other uh, reasonably well, uh, he said, uh, much of history is dull and boring and gives you a permanent dull pain in the head, but when it's done properly, it's like poetry. And he did it properly. So I uh, discovered, if you like, the poetic qualities of history. Uh, the patterns, um, the ironies, um, the um, unintended consequences, uh, the patterns of change and so on. So um, this speaks to the importance of mentors and uh, I was very fortunate. I've been very fortunate in having some excellent mentors but he was the one who really uh, changed my uh, life, my course of, uh, of direction uh, and moving it into the field of history. This isn't the same mentor that you once told me about that claimed you were wasted in history, is it? <laughs> it's not the same one, is it? No. That's a different no, mentor. That, that, was, that came from uh, the, my days as a graduate student at Queen's, the, uh, the Kingston, Ontario Queen's, as opposed to the Belfast one. And a uh, good friend of mine, uh, Terry Campbell and myself, uh, would uh, drink and laugh and talk a lot. And Terry had, had and has a terrific sense of humor. And uh, one of the professors there uh, said to us one day, you two are wasted in history. And I love the double meaning of wasted, <laughs> uh, because we were wasted a lot of the time. Uh, and the sense that uh, we should both have had uh, careers with Saturday Night Live or something <laughs> other than being in the historical profession was one that rather appealed to us. And so I'm going to pick up on this thread about storytelling and oration and art and poetry and I guess maybe broadly characterized as the performative. Do you, I mean, I've heard you give lectures and I've read your work and there's a wonderful element of that performativity in your own historical product, right? But do you think that the writing and the teaching and just the doing of history has changed since you were either an undergrad or a graduate student or, you know, even through your career at the University of Toronto to um, be more open to the crossovers between the arts, the performative arts and history. And I ask this knowing that you're a musician as well, but so it's a deliberate, you know, yeah, I want you to say yes, but I want to trouble <laughs> it too, right? There's, there are a lot of directions this one could go in from your question. Um, First of all, uh, the importance of communicating ideas to a general audience has always been very important to me. Um, and, uh, and doing that in, in a way that sounds cliched, I suppose, but that brings the subject to life, that makes you connect with real people facing real dilemmas in real situations. Um, that's very important to me and always has been. Um, whether it takes the form of a lecture or a seminar or a radio documentary or um, a musical performance, words and music, a show we do, I do on Darcy McGee with some musicians, for example. Uh, but there's a constant factor there. But the other part of your question concerns the, the changes in the historical profession. And there certainly have been. I mean, when I was an undergraduate student at the University of York, uh, the main themes that concerned us were big ones. Um, revolution, uh, guerrilla warfare, colonialism, anti-colonialism, uh, uh, political ideologies, uh, democratic, uh, conservative, Whig, Tory, the works. Um, and class was central to all of this, and an examination of class. And E.P. Thompson's The Making of the English Working Class was a, a kind of historian's or a social historian's Bible at this time. Right. Uh, a book that is that has its flaws, but also uh, has its appeal um, and its strengths. 
And so this was, uh, this was the world um, that I was immersed in. And then when we came to Canada and I went to Queens, we shifted, uh, this is the first shift that I noticed, um, the emphasis wasn't so much on class. In fact, class was hardly ever discussed in, in the courses I took at Queen's. Identity was paramount. Uh, the Canadian identity versus the American identity, or uh, the identity of Nova Scotians, were they British, were they New Englanders, or something in between. Um, and the notion of collective identity crises was paramount. Now. I have my issues with class as a concept, and I also have my issues with collective identity uh, as a concept, uh, both of which seem to me to operate at far too general a level um, to, be, to be useful analytical tools. But that's a whole other question. <laughs> that's a whole other yes, kind of yes, conversation. For several yeah. hours. Uh, but uh, the changes that took place uh, uh, after that, I mean, identity became to, came to work in different fields, different areas. Um, so ethnic identities uh, um, and, um, and subgroup identities. So uh, a significant degree of fragmentation uh, occurred. And that, that has its benefits, but also uh, I think its costs as well. I'm not suggesting that we go back to grand narrative history, um, uh, not at all. Um, but um, I'm, always, I'm always trying to, to draw out uh, issues of general importance from particular situations. Uh, what uh, do specific cases reveal uh, about the human condition, uh, uh, about who we are and what our strengths and weaknesses and potentials and, uh, and dangers are? Um, and it concerns me uh, that um, in the way that academic history has developed, uh, there is actually less emphasis on communicating ideas to a general audience and more emphasis um, on writing for one another. Um, and, uh, and quite often this is couched in, um, in a theoretical language or, or language of theory um, that too often um, jargonizes the obvious, uh, to use Karl Berger's phrase, um, and too often uh, operates at um, a very abstract level uh, with, quite, with, with, with a frequent result that uh, realities on the ground can be uh, assessed in terms of the extent to which they measure up to a priori theories. Um, and, yeah. and I would like to see um, uh, an inversion. What, I'd like to see an Hegelian inversion of this. <laughs> you know, uh, I, think, I think we should start uh, with our feet on the ground. And I think two of the greatest prose writers in the English language, neither of whom is an historian, are Jonathan Swift and George Orwell. And it was Jonathan Swift who developed the concept of a flying island, a floating island of Laputa, where right. intellectuals are detached from realities <laughs> on the ground. That's a wonderful section of Gulliver's Travels. But then, and, and George Orwell, who Orwell. said that he, he always wrote with his feet on the ground. And, yeah. uh, and um, uh, Swift and Orwell have all sorts, I mean, I'm not sure I want a statue to Swift or Orwell uh, for various <laughs> reasons. You can get into statues separately if you like. Uh, but those insights were very important, are very important to me. Right. I've always thought that more people and some of my friends and colleagues should read Orwell's essays on the use of the English language, right? And it's, yeah. it's not read often enough. Agreed. But do you think um, that when you say that the communication element of writing and doing history uh, went through a phase of sort of retracting from or becoming less conscious of a public audience or a wide audience outside, you know, if we want to call it the ivory tower or a certain very discreet audiences, do you think it's shifting again? Like it, my feeling is that certainly either from external forces like funding agencies or even internally in universities that there is not enough necessarily, but an increasing recognition of, we could call it public engagement, we could call it public intellectualism, public activity, however that, yeah. that matters, you know? Like, do you think that the pendulum might... It, it depends. Is it swinging I mean, back? 
when it when it's uh, when it's presented in grant proposals as uh, listing deliverables to stakeholders, right. that is not yeah. going to work. Outcomes, <laughs> right. and outcomes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the very bureaucratic, formulaic language that's used is a big red flag for me. Um, lip service is paid to it, uh, and there are there are certainly some historians um, uh, who believe very strongly, as I do, in presenting uh, nuanced arguments. Um, in a compelling way to a general audience. Uh, yes, indeed, there are many people uh, who are doing that. Um, but there's also, I think, um, uh, a large gap that remains between the way a lot of history is actually written uh, uh, and communicated within uh, a fairly narrow uh, academic world um, and uh, a, a public hunger, I think, actually, for more general history. Oh, I would now, agree. Now, yeah. um, the, the, the key is to do is to write general history without dumbing it down. And I mean, a lot of general histories that, that I've read uh, are frankly embarrassing because uh, they might emphasise the dramatic uh, over things that are less dramatic but, but more significant. Uh, I mean, one finds this in television version, television versions of history. Um, you know the the, uh, the story of Canada, or this is us, or whatever it was called. This is Canada. I can't right. remember the name of that of the last series. But I remember watching the first two programs and thinking, enough already. Uh, <laughs> or even in the story of Canada, which was done uh, by Mark Storowitz, uh, a, a terrific storyteller, a good number of years ago. When you consider, for example, um, how the Irish were portrayed in that. And, and this is perfectly understandable given the demands of storytelling. Right. Uh, but the Irish w were portrayed through Black 47, uh, the, the worst year of migration, uh, the famine migration and uh, the horrors of gross eel, none of which should be forgotten. Uh, that was point one, and point two was the assassination of Thomas Darcy McGee. I mean, these are very dramatic high points, but they also give a completely distorted view of the overall Irish-Canadian experience, the experience of migration and settlement and so on. Uh, uh, so uh, there's a danger in writing popular history or presenting uh, history in, through uh, media such as television that the dramatic is going to be um, overplayed. Um, and, and there's also something else I'd say here too, and that is the notion of of history as storytelling has become very popular. And this might surprise you, but, um, but I, I, mean, I love, I love uh, uh, the medium of, uh, of narrative and ideas embedded in narrative. I love that approach, but I do not subscribe to the view that history is a story. If you're writing a biography, as I've done, uh, embedding ideas in narrative is absolutely essential. It's the best way of doing it. Um, if you're doing radio documentaries, which, which I've done with ideas, um, the narrative form works best. But history is, the, the, the origin, the etymology of history is inquiry. History means inquiry, not story. And what we should be doing, above all, is conducting an inquiry. And the nature of that inquiry will vary depending on who we are and when we are, um, what our angles of vision uh, are and so on. Um, but storytelling is only one form of historical communication. Uh, analysis is very, very important as well. And the key then is to present not only history as story, but history as analysis in a way that will grip and engage a general audience. That's the challenge. It is the challenge, I think, in the taking the analysis or the function of analysis or communication of analysis and making that gripping. Because my own experience taking history courses as an undergraduate, only as an undergraduate, that's when I stopped taking history courses, is that, um, and I had great, fantastic instructors and professors as well, uh, and the delivery of the lecture or the seminar session was always for me much more engaging than the reading of the texts prescribed. Now this was many, many decades ago, and so I can't speak for how well written those historical texts or required books were. But there is a, for, from someone with my background in literature, it was, it, 
there was a few and far between of those history books or texts or required readings that I found as engaging as when it became the, the genesis of or the, the stimulus for an, a conversation and a discussion. So the writing of history is somehow not, I, don't th I think we need to disengage that sometimes from the communication of history because you've talked about film and television, we're doing a podcast and public lectures. And so I guess I'm going to ask this one last question about the writing of history and then we'll move on. Um, do you think the tradition of academic publishing, the monograph, is coming or going? Is it going to stay, right, as a historian, right? I'm and, very... Thinking of grad students who might be listening to this and anticipating, you know, a career in historical studies of some shape and form. I very, very much hope it stays um, because the monograph... Uh, uh, can provide the freedom and flexibility for a wide variety of approaches. I mean, the one thing we don't want to get into is the is the five chapter monograph. You know the, right. the you, you know what I mean. You I do. The historiographical yeah. introduction and the three main areas, and then the conclusion, pulling it all together. Um, that kind of uh, arid formulaic approach needs to be jettisoned, uh, I think. <laughs> but um, uh, but a monograph can give you so much freedom, which is actually why. Um, I prefer it to um, to radio documentaries. I mean, I've done both, and I um, I was telling you yesterday I, I found doing radio documentaries with CBC Ideas an absolutely exhilarating experience. Um, but there were a couple of things that that began to wear thin, and one was the notion then, at any rate, that it's very ephemeral. You might get 40,000 people, but you wouldn't get, for a mon you wouldn't get readers for a monograph in our field. Right. Uh, you might get 40,000 people listening to a, an ideas broadcast, but then it's gone. gone. It's, 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 it's an ephemeral, or it was then, um, an ephemeral uh, form, uh, whereas a monograph stays. Uh, and the other thing is, getting back to the, uh, to the notion of narrative, you're, you're already sort of, you're trapped, in, in a sense, by the storytelling approach, uh, because that is the most effective medium means of communication in a radio documentary. But a monograph, you can do anything with. Really. So you find it liberating. I do. It can be. Yeah, it can be. It can yeah. be. Yeah. And I think what happens often um, is that your first book. And I've seen this over and over again in the profession, and it applies to my own first book as well, on Thomas Paine and William Cobbett. Uh, your first book will follow the lines of your dissertation fairly closely. Uh, you know, you're, you're following the, basically the rules of a certain game to try and get your book out there. But once, once that's been established, um, you're, you're uh, potentially free to cut loose. And I'll give you a really good example of that from, from my field of uh, Irish and Irish-Canadian history, and that's Donald Harmon Akinson, um, whose uh, first books were on uh, the Church of Ireland, the bureaucratic history of the Church of Ireland, and the Irish educational system, um, and uh, they were very scholarly, um, uh, very well researched. Um, but then, when he started to uh, cut loose and... Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, and do his work on the Irish in Canada and uh, on and on uh, religious history. Uh, the tone became much less formal, and uh, and the scope, the breadth became uh, uh, much more exciting. Yeah. Um, so yeah. potentially, the, the monograph I think gives you great freedom. I, 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 one of my concerns is that the monograph may. Uh, fade out in this uh, in this world of the, of the high tech revolution. If it Long does, the monograph. <laughs> hopefully after <laughs> we're gone. All right, I'm going to shift gears a bit, but I, I'm detecting some threads in in some of the things you've been saying. So we agreed in advance that we would limit this topic to a very short amount of time. But you talked about Canadian identity and crises of identity and how frustrating that is at times because of the generalization without the feet on the ground element, right? So we're recording this podcast um, on the same day that Americans are going to their midterm elections. And so all sorts of issues and questions around borders and identities and communities are certainly been percolating, if not you know, volcanically exploding in some ways in, to our southern neighbors. But the topic I've got one question for you is, is I want to go to Brexit. 
And be, I asked this question, I'm going to betray my own interest in it, because it strikes me as incredibly interesting, but not altogether surprising, that all of the media coverage, and some of it very deep and analytical, and some of it quite superficial, around Brexit from before the, the vote and all the way through the negotiations, there was hardly any, in the UK press, hardly any mention of the Irish border between the Republic and Northern Ireland. But now as we get down to the wire in terms of the Brexit negotiations, the Irish border has become all of a sudden a topic again. And so I just wonder what your you know, general thoughts are, or maybe even from you know, feet on the ground, uh, about the, the question of the, how the Irish question again has become for some, if not many, a central problem in British politics and now European politics. First, right. first of all, I'm glad you're not asking me about the U.S. midterms. No, I just thought I'd mention that. that. <laughs> but 2016 was a was a rough year from my perspective uh, with the election of uh, Donald J. Trump. Yeah, I'm still uh, not and, over it myself. So and, there with, we go. and with Brexit. Um, yeah, it was a double whammy, uh, right? Yes, indeed. Yeah. And um, and a fear is that, that this would begin the great unraveling of. Uh, of a, an agreement or set of agreements that has uh, kept the Western right. world at least in a state of, uh, of relative peace, or much of the Western world in a state of relative peace uh, since 1945. Uh, but yes, on Brexit, uh, you're quite right. Uh, the question of the border is back, and it should have been there right from, from the, the beginning. start. Yes. Um, and it's, it's a, a huge question. Um, we have a Conservative government in power, uh, which can remain in power uh, only through the support of the Democratic Unionist Party of Northern Ireland, uh, which uh, does not want Northern Ireland to be treated any differently from the rest of the United Kingdom. Um, obviously, I mean, that's central to their position. Um, and uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, we have the British uh, and European Union, British government in the European Union uh, promising that there will be no hard border and uh, I'm, I honestly don't see how that circle can be squared. Uh, I, I, I can't help but think uh, Theresa May is thinking the same thing and regretting the deal with the devil she made when the arrangement with the DUP came about to, for her to be able to form her government. I have to, I do, I do, I play this insane game where I imagine what's going through um, her mind whenever she has to have a conversation or indeed a formal, in any way formal engagement with members of the DUP. I'm being less diplomatic than David is here in terms of my opinions about the DUP. But um, yeah, it'll be, I mean, I'm not going to ask you to speculate on how it's going to play out because I don't think we can know. But there are very specific, and there's a lot of people on the ground in those border areas, you know, on the Republic and the Northern Ireland side, that I know are um, deeply distressed by not knowing, right, from by not having Indeed. any sense, yes, right, of yeah, what's going to happen, yeah. and and that these higher level, which happens frequently, right, higher level, you know, politicians make decisions, and then the people on the ground have to live with the ramifications. But these ramifications have you know, yeah. decades if not centuries of history yeah. behind them, right? Uh, the, the economist and economic historian J.K. Galbraith once said economists uh, predict the future not because they know but because they're asked. And, That's um, true. <laughs> and, and, and I, I, cannot, I cannot predict no. uh, what will come of this. Um, I, as I say, I, can, I cannot see any way that um, the uh, the desires of the Democratic Unionist Party, uh, the Unionists in Northern Ireland generally, uh, to be treated the same as everyone else in the UK, uh, and the arrangement to have, or the agreement uh, to have a, um, a soft border. I do not see how those contradictory impulses can be reconciled. However, had you asked me um, in the uh, late 1980s, mm -hmm. if I uh, could ever see uh, Ian Paisley and Jerry Adams uh, working together, yeah. uh, I would have said you're out of your mind. So I suppose never say never yeah. in politics, but uh, this will take uh, some uh, extraordinary 
some extraordinary mental gymnastics. Now, Irish history is full of uh, mental gymnastics. And we consider <laughs> Eamon de Valera taking the oath while pretending he had the oath of allegiance uh, to the crown while pretending he wasn't taking an oath of allegiance to the crown after supporting uh, the losing side in the civil war over that very issue. But, but some extraordinary mental gymnastics will be required uh, to resolve this one. Well, let's hope that there are some <clears throat> gymnasts at, at the table when it's required. Okay, so our third um, topic, and we'll wrap it up with this one. I'm going to bring you back to the doing of history uh, and a little bit more back also to Canadian history because while we've been talking just now a bit more about Irish and British relations, uh, you really are a Canadian historian as much as you are an Irish historian. So it would seem. I guess so, and I'm not going to try and like fix you or label you in any way. But um, the George Story lecture that you'll be giving in, in two nights' time is it's about the Fenians in Canada and the Fenian invasion or attempted invasion, but also, so that's the specific historical circumstances, but I think people will be interested and hopefully discussion will happen around, you know, what happens when notions of civil society are threatened and state security is, is deployed in some fashion. So do you want to maybe just give a snapshot of the story lecture? Can you do that? Given that you get an hour on Thursday night and I'm asking for three minutes. I'll give you the Reader's Digest <laughs> yes. version. Uh, yes, the Athenians have had a, a bad and in some ways a strange press in Canada. Um, uh, they've been viewed um, uh, Actually, in, in uh, sometimes in stereotypically um, racist terms, as the uh, the product of uh, a typically Irish harebrained scheme uh, to liberate Ireland uh, through the bizarre route of invading Canada. It um, does generally um, solicit laughter and giggles at the idea when you know spoken it, it, about. It does, by, right? and, uh, and minus I hope the ethnic stereotyping. Uh, uh, when I came into the subject, I felt the same way, um, and also the the dominant assumptions were that uh, although there were Fenians in the United States, uh, there were hardly any in Canada, uh, uh, and most of the historians who worked in the field, not all, Peter Toner is a significant exception, but most of the historians who worked in the field uh, uh, regarded Fenianism within Canada as risible and or inconsequential. Um, and, uh, and so I went in uh, assuming that that was a correct historical view. Well, ten years of working on Thomas Darcy McGee changed my mind utterly uh, on both points. Uh, that if you actually look at the sources of information that were available to the Fenians, uh, their ideological imperatives, uh, what they believed the American government was and was not going to do, uh, what they could say in public and what their strategies were in private, uh, there was a certain rationale uh, to, uh, uh, to liberating Ireland through attacking Canada. The idea basically was to trigger an Anglo-American war. war. That's that right. was the hope. Um, and. Uh, uh, if you could get a foothold in Canada uh, with the connivance of the American government, uh, it would plunge Anglo-American relations, which were already in a poor state after the Civil War, uh, into crisis at the same time that it would inspire Irish revolutionaries at home, which actually the, the, the victory of the Fenians at the Battle of Ridgeway on June 2nd, 1866 did. It did inspire Irish revolutionaries and Irish constitutional nationalists at home. So this, this was not a million miles, uh, this assumption was not a million miles moved from the reality. Um, so there was a, there was a rationale uh, that was operating here. So that was, that, that's something I'm going to address in the lecture. The, that it's actually a failure of historical imagination to uh, write off the invasion attempt um, as uh, a bizarre act of uh, <laughs> of Irish lunacy. Irish like. lunacy, yeah, um, yeah. But the other thing is, working on McGee, it became apparent. Two things became apparent to me uh, in the course of my research in this two-volume biography I did on Thomas Darcy McGee, um, and one was that. Uh, 
Fenianism within Canada was actually quite a significant force. I mean, there were a minority of Irish Catholics in Canada, but they were a significant minority. Much depends on how you define Fenianism. If you define it um, as someone who is a sworn member of the Fenian Brotherhood, dedicated uh, to the violent overthrow of British rule in Ireland, uh, then they are a fairly small group. But if you um, if you take a more ge generic definition of people who supported the goal of liberating Ireland uh, from Britain uh, through the use of armed, uh, an armed revolution, then there was actually a, a great deal of support for Fenianism uh, within Canada. And it also became apparent to me that a minority of the Fenians, so we're looking at a minority within a minority here, uh, were prepared to use extreme measures to support uh, an Irish-American invading force. Uh, including taking cabinet ministers uh, hostage, uh, burning down buildings, uh, destroying communications, blowing up bridges, destroying telegraph communications, um, suborning the militia, spiking the guns uh, of, of soldiers and so on, infiltrating the uh, uh, British regiments in Canada. Uh, all these things were, were discussed, uh, some of them were attempted uh, by a small minority of Fenians. So this is, that's one general point that came out. The other general point was the uh, operations of the Canadian secret police. And there are thousands, literally thousands of letters in one source alone, the John A. MacDonald papers, uh, letters uh, from the spy masters to detectives in the field, back up to the spy masters, to John A. MacDonald and back down the chain. There are at least 3,000 of these. Um, and uh, these had never been uh, fully uh, analyzed. There have been some, there have been some good work done, including by uh, uh, Memorial's own uh, Greg Keeley, who did some very good work on this. Uh, but there's much more uh, that needs to be said, and this, the subject can be explored in much greater depth. Um, so, and then from there, the question of once you have, a, if you accept the existence of the Fenian underground in Canada, uh, some of whose members were you know, ultra revolutionary. Um, and you look at the operations of the secret police force, um, then, the, then the question uh, arises of the balance between uh, state security and civil liberty. To what extent was the state under threat? And actually the existence of Canada as a state was not under threat by the Fenians. Uh, but the Fenians could have done, and did, they did some damage, but they, could have, they, they posed a threat uh, in local terms, border terms, uncertainty, uh, uh, in terms of the Canadian budget being boosted to deal with the potential military attacks because no one knew exactly where they might come. Um, so it wasn't an existential threat, but it was a serious threat nonetheless. And then how does the, how does the government deal with that? What's the balance between civil liberty and state security? Um, we face these issues now. How did they deal with it back then? And um, at the George M. Story Lecture, I will be offering my views on the nature of that balance. I can't wait. It's, it's such an important question. And if nothing else comes out of the lecture, the George Story Lecture this year, if people start asking those questions more often and more frequently, then we can call it an absolute success, I think, right? And listen to the, I don't want to go into the cliche of the lessons of history because we don't necessarily want to replicate it, right? Another cliche, but understanding how these questions were discussed and thought through has got to be a revelation that's important, how they were thought through, who was working on these relationships between civil liberty and state security, and um, who ended up making the decisions and why. Right? Those, are, those are some of the angles that I think will be most gratifying to hear about. Uh, David, I'm going to stop us there, even though I know you, I mean, you and I know we could go on forever. Um, but I'm just going to end this podcast by, first of all, thanking you for coming to Memorial University. And I'm also going to thank the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences for both sponsoring and keeping the George Story Lecture going. And a huge thank you to John Sandlos and the Nexus Center for giving us this time and this air and this recording. And um, so thank you, David. Thank you very much. For more information on David Wilson's work and the George Story Lecture, please follow the links on our show notes page. To find out more about future episodes of Cross Currents, you can follow us on Twitter at Nexus Center, search up our Facebook page, or subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and YouTube. The music used in the podcast was licensed under a Creative Commons license. 
and you can find out more about the music through links on our show notes. The Nexus Centre is generously supported by the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences and the Vice President's Research Office at Memorial University. Keep tuning in for upcoming episodes of Cross Currents, where we will be posting talks from recent workshops at the Nexus Centre on the environmental humanities and on the issue of climate change. We hope you can join us.